All right, folks, welcome. I am Lee, and this is part two of our Morphing Workbench build. We left off from part one, where we got our two sheets of three-quarter inch plywood laminated together with wood glue. And in case you missed part one, this workbench will incorporate a table saw, a miter saw, and a router. The reason we get to call this a morphing workbench is that our miter saw there will rotate in and out of use. And when we're not using it, we'll be able to rotate it out of the way, flip it underneath, and we'll have a flat monolithic working surface on that workbench. On screen, we're looking at the bottom side of the workbench tabletop area. I used a jigsaw for this cutout and by the time the blade protruded through the bottom of that cut, which we're looking at the underside of, by the time the blade protruded through there, it had flexed and gotten out of alignment. And so I wasn't satisfied with how that came out. So, I, you know, I was trying to make a determination on, on what I wanted to do with that. Since the cut looked good from the top side, I decided that I will revisit the issue uh, further along in the build and make any make up any remedies or fixes as needed and if needed to that. I want this workbench or assembly tabletop to remain as rigid and as square as possible. So I'm going to frame the entire outline of the underside of this thing. That's what brings us to the next interesting tidbit. You'll see that I am cutting two by fours for this, but a goal that I have for this or an idea that I have for this is for it not to scream, hey, I was made out of two by fours screwed together when you look at this thing. This is just a personal challenge to myself and being that I have made several two by four workbenches in the past, I kind of wanted to make something to the next level. So if you saw part one, you've seen I've already glued two almost whole entire sheets of three quarter inch plywood together. I've never done that before, so that was pretty cool. And now the next thing I'm going to do is uh, use as much um, non-traditional two by four and drywall screw workbench building skills as I can. I'm trying to break outside the comfort zone there and I'm going to be doing some lap joints in this project as well as getting rid of that factory radius corner edges on those two by fours. So we're going to do everything we can to disguise these two by fours and maybe dare I say dress this thing up a little bit. I am not working from a set of plans here, and I am very much making it up as I go. So it probably goes without saying that there's a lot of trial and error throughout this build. On screen here, I've now got all my framing outline pieces cut to length. I'm going to go ahead and grab the table saw, and what I'll do next with those cut to length pieces is I'll start ripping those uh, down to the width that I want to get rid of those factory radius edges and really begin to disguise the factory 2x4 look out of these things. I started off by taking 1 8 of an inch off of each side of these boards and since that was so much fun I took another 1 8 of an inch off of each of those boards so I got to go through that process twice and I was actually needed to take a full quarter inch off of each side to uh, fully get rid of that radius edge that we're wanting to get rid of and get down to some nice squared up boards for our workbench. By doing that, what we ultimately end up with is those boards are one and a half inches thick, which is the factory thickness, and then three inches wide as we've now taken a quarter inch off of each side totaling at half an inch uh, which was three and a half when we bought those and now we're down to three inches wide 
and one and a half inches thick. You can see we've got the shop vac hooked up to the table saw and I've also got the dust collector up on top there and I found that really helpful with catching the sawdust that that tends to just kick out on the top side. Those pine strips from the cutoffs, I actually ended up keeping those. They make great firewood kindling for my wood stove. Next, we are going to move over to our bandsaw. I grab a square and just do some quick checks to see if we're at least cutting somewhat straight with this thing. At this stage, I am wanting to begin with my lap joints. As with many things, there are multiple ways to do this. And I like my new secondhand bandsaw, so I wanted to try it out for this task. It was a fun go, but I quickly decided that I think I wanted to try the table saw to do this instead. So I got the table saw set up and gave it a try. And as I had suspected, I was happier with the results. I try to always use a test piece of material. That way I'm not experimenting on the pieces that I'm really wanting to keep and know exactly what the expected results are when I cut into those pieces. Trial and error will continue to be a major theme throughout this project, but the upside is that through trials and through errors, I become proficient at certain steps along the way. So when I need to go back and repeat a step, I already know what I'm doing. This is actually great news because I had to go back and retry and remake several of these frame pieces to get all the lap joints to end up exactly the way I wanted them along the way. Regarding the table saw, the single blade there did get the job done, but I can definitely say a dado stack would have been very beneficial. There are definitely some checks and balances happening here. The table saw was pretty nice and affordable here that I'm using, but the plastic miter gauge there is a little flimsy and this saw also will not accept a dado stack that I'm aware of. I took a look at the arbor on the motor and it's pretty short. You might be able to squeeze maybe one extra blade on there, but that's about it. For now, I am going to chalk this saw up as sufficient and definitely say that I am grateful to be able to have it and be able to do this project in the first place. On screen there, you can see that I broke one of the lap joints and I'm doing a quick repair with some wood glue and a clamp. I am leaving a three quarter inch overhang on those because when I attach the legs, uh, we're going to be doing castle joints with those and I believe those should look pretty awesome. I have to apologize for this portion of the recording looking like it was filmed with a potato. There must have been a smudge or something on the camera lens for this part. The section that I'm working right there in the middle where the tabletop is at its thinnest, that was the main area that I was most concerned about having any warpage or bowing when any uh, weight was applied to it. I don't believe it would break under the strain of anything I'd be doing, but uh, th this is definitely what influenced me to want to put these boards on. The dust port on the table saw kept clogging due to the nature of the cuts that I was making and those little pine wood cookies kind of falling down in there and blocking the port. So I would shut it down and pull the throat plate off and stick a scrap down in there and crush those up so that they would get pulled out through the exhaust port. In the background, you'll probably notice from time to time throughout most any of these videos that the shop mascot seems to maintain a pretty steady presence. And he, I find that he's actually surprisingly brave at times because I'll have the dust collector and the shop vac and sometimes even a saw running and he'll show up and come cruising through uh, regardless of the loud noises that you would typically associate with a cat being afraid of. Y'all are probably sick of watching me cut lap joints by now, so let's go ahead and move on to the next part. All right, the exhaust port on the table saw has now clogged one too many times. So we're gonna take a look and see if 
Maybe there's not something we can do about it to at least help. Now, I know what's causing the majority of this issue, so we're going to go ahead and flip this thing upwards to where we can see down the exhaust and take a look to where you all can join me in making this fix. You probably do not need the ocular capabilities of a bald eagle to see what the problem is here. That aluminum shape there about the size of a nickel protruding down in the way seems to be what's catching a lot of things and clogging up the works. I decided to give it an initial challenge with a regular set of slip joint pliers. And if it wanted to resist, we can go more drastic with our approach. Have you ever had to saw on a saw before? Well, that's what we're going to do today. Out comes the trusty recip saw and some metal cutting blades. Got a couple of them to choose from and sort through here. Get just the right size. That one will do. Yep. Get it installed. And let's go to work. Now, I'm sure the designer of this table saw put this tab in the way there for some reason to do a safety. Probably to keep a toddler from sticking his little hand up in there and making contact with the blade. Or to keep your little sister's pet hamster from crawling up there and meeting its demise. And while I appreciate these safety efforts from the manufacturer, most likely just to protect themselves from some Sue Happy lawyer, my sanity also has to be taken into consideration. And being that there are no regular visits from pint-sized children or hamsters in my shop, we are going to go ahead and yield to the preservation of sanity. All that being said, don't try this at home, kids, and any attempts to replicate this action is done so at your own risk. Now that that's out of the way, let's get back to the fun stuff. Here is all the stuff that was stuck in there. The little obstructive piece of aluminum, about the size of a nickel, and all the little pieces of wood that were jammed up against it that should no longer be a problem. Those should go right into the dust collector now. No more clogs, hopefully. You can see that that four inch dust collector hose gobbles those pieces up, no problem. Some folks may be concerned about me putting a larger hose over top of a smaller diameter outlet on the table saw, but I have found in this application anyways, that it does a fine job just like that and pulls extra air from around the saw as well. And I like what it does, so it works for me. I've replicated this with the hose on the miter saw as well. And again, it just works. Here's one last bit of me dancing around with the lap joints, and then we'll move on to the castle joints for the legs. All right, back to the bandsaw here. Some of you may have noticed the blade in the earlier portion of this video was deflecting quite a bit. And so I knew I had to come back and do a bit of tuning to get this thing just right to behave a little better. The bandsaw you're looking at here has several bearings that you're looking at above the blade. There's a bearing on each side and there's a bearing behind the blade. And that, that was the main one that needed an adjustment. When I applied pressure feeding into the blade, uh, the blade would deflect backwards away from me. So that needed to be taken care of. And we did do that. There are also more bearings below the table that you cannot see. Uh, those play a role as well and those all have to be adjusted correctly and properly to have a good running and well-tuned bandsaw. I wanted to give the bandsaw another chance here uh, so I used it for a test in creating what I wanted out of these castle joints that I'm making. You may call it funny or ironic but I ended up preferring the table saw for these cuts as well. The waste from these cuts ended up getting caught between the throat plate and the blade of the saw, so 
in this particular situation on this occasion, it did not end up being ideal as compared to the table saw for this series of cuts. So back to the table saw we go. Now the whole point of these castle joints with the legs uh, that I'm wanting to do here is to further disguise the use of our 2x4 lumber. Those first few pieces you saw there were the obligatory test pieces, so of course they weren't going to be pretty. Next we move into the good pieces that we're trying to do just right and keep. By the time I rip the legs for the workbench, they'll be roughly three inches wide. So I wanted to take down the exposed portion of the tabletop frame to one inch wide so that it will present uh, proportionately through the castellated table legs. So basically at the corners with the table legs, you'll see one inch of table leg and then one inch of the frame piece sandwiched in the middle and another one inch of table leg. And if that's terribly difficult to envision with the way I explained it, don't worry. We'll get to see exactly what that looks like later in this build when we get it all put together. That's enough talk about castle joints for now. We'll circle back to that later. How are we going to attach this frame to the top? Well, I've decided we're going to go with pocket hole screws. I just so happened to see this Craig XL pocket hole screw kit at the local Orange hardware store. And it is specifically geared towards two by and four by dimensional lumber. And being that I was trying to add a little bit of extra class to this project, the little voice inside my head said, hey, that would probably be a pretty good idea. And I agreed. So I went ahead and grabbed it and brought it home. Oh, I paid for it, by the way, at the checkout. This was all legal. So after a quick unpackaging and a brief review of the manufacturer's suggestions, I was on my way drilling pocket holes. You probably will not be surprised to know that I was sure to drill a test piece first before going into my actual work pieces that I've worked so hard on to get to this point. The screws being used in this application are Craig, I believe number 14. They are two and a half inch coarse thread screws. And I believe again also that they have an exterior coating on them for exterior protection to the elements in case you need that kind of thing. Protection from the elements, not to the elements. The elements probably don't need protected. All right, so I'm cruising along, drilling pocket holes with the assistance of a Jorgensen six inch clamp that I got off of Amazon. I will link it below. And so, Sometimes I have to come up with these mind games that help keep me from screwing up. Now notice I said help, not prevent, because lo and behold, there's usually some way I still figure out how to screw it up, not on purpose. As we know, a lot of time has gone into getting these work pieces to the point at which they are and so we do not want to make a mistake and drill one incorrectly the wrong direction on the wrong side or anything like that. So I am using my mighty blue pen to mark the correct orientation of which direction the drilling needs to happen and on which side before I even pick it up if I can. So er in the early stage of grabbing each piece to go ahead and do the drilling on it, I do everything I can to make some marks on it to ensure I've got the correct orientation for drilling direction and the drilling side. And so fortunately that worked out and we did not drill any incorrect holes. So it must have worked. On the first round here, I simply drilled a hole six inches from each end of each board. And then one right in the middle if there was an obviously large gap between those ends. From there, I just kept adding more, splitting the difference between holes until I could not add anymore without going under 
six inches of spacing between each screw hole. Once again, if I've done a terrible job of describing that, just go off of what you see in the video. And that's what I did. Next, I need to clean up a bit. I do not want any debris under these boards for final assembly. And of course, anytime I sit down for a break, the shop mascot shows up. And back to it, I do some cleaning up with the dust collector. I kind of think of it as the big gulp. I have to make sure the shop mascot is safely tucked away before I start whipping that thing around. When I was a kid, these guys used to come by on the street from the town maintenance department with a big giant leaf sucking vacuum. I guess this is as close as I'll ever get to being one of those guys. They'd come around every fall a couple times. Raking all the leaves to the curb was always a chore, but watching those guys come by was always fun to watch as a kid. My brother and I always made sure each other knew the leaf machine was almost to our house. Anyway, so we get all cleaned up, and I want to clamp these all into place. Here I start with my Jorgensen clamps. And I guess there was some name change or something with the Pony brand and the Jorgensen brand. Anyway, those orange clamp brand guys, I'm using them. And I also have these Bessie clamps, they're red. And I'll have more to say about those different clamps later. And I go around this thing, I clamp all of our boards into place. I absolutely want to make sure they do not move when I'm trying to screw them down. I want these things to be locked in place nice and square because this workbench and tabletop is going to be what hopefully a lot of future projects are going to be based off of. So I really want to take my time, do this right, make it look good, make it behave well. Uh, I want to be confident in it. And of course, I want to be proud of it, happy with it, satisfied with it. So, you know, we do our best here. The next thing I do is grab another one of my squares and I set it up like a depth gauge and I am measuring for the three quarter inch standoff for the overhang of the tabletop, which is what I've designed into this piece. And I went all around and checked all of our alignment. And everything came within about 1 16th of an inch. So I guess you could say our tolerance for this project is about a 16th of an inch. And that's just what we're working off of. We could probably chase it down to a 32nd or less than that. But at some point, you, know, you have to decide what is enough. You know, what, what's good enough, what's uh, satisfactory, what is effective, uh, and for the amount of time that you're, you're going to spend on putting it together and using it. Okay, it is a relief to say we've got a whole bunch of screws in this thing holding it together now. All of our work is locked into place. It's not going anywhere. So that is a nice relief and a feeling of accomplishment. We did end up three screws short. We needed 33 screws for this, 30 coming a pack. So being three short, I left three clamps on exactly roughly in the area where we still needed screws to make sure nothing moved and to help me quickly find where those additional screws need to go in once I acquire them. And all that being said, now I'm actually going to get set up to do some gluing. I want to work on the table legs. So I will need to cut some boards to length and then get those glued up to continue forward progress on our workbench project. I was definitely ready for a break from kneeling and crawling around on the ground working on things. And let me tell you, it felt good to stand up and work on some things at this table for a change. I also got out my old reliable roller stand and if you do not have one of these I highly recommend getting one if you're doing any kind of work similar to this. Uh, it's adjustable, height adjustable and you know helps hold your work pieces level and catch them and you'll see it in use throughout several portions of my videos and projects and it was a good purchase for me. I'm, I'm glad I acquired it, and 
I get to use it pretty regularly. From what I have figured, these workbench legs need to be 30 and a half inches long. So what I'm gonna do is cut these pieces at 31 inches, and then I will glue them up, and I can do with a, the final cleanup trim on them once they're glued up and they'll come out just right. I'm going to rip these through the table saw just the same as I did on all the other boards to get rid of the edge radiuses. Radiuses? Radius I? Radii? You know what I mean. So far I have found that the red clamps stay standing better than the orange ones do for glue ups like this. And, but the orange ones have a handle that's easier to grip. Now it's time to throw down some tight bond original and spread it around with a spatula like icing a cake. Applying these clamps, the effective spacing seems to be six to eight inches according to the squeeze out of the glue, which is also what Google said. So I have to say, Google, I agree with you. For the next glue up, I'll be using the orange clamps. And what I found is that the handles are a little bit bigger and a little bit grippier on those. And I, I did kind of like that, but the orange clamps did not stay standing as easily as what the red handle clamps did. So they both have their pluses and minuses. I borrowed some screws from other parts of the bench to secure those edges so I could get my clamps for these glue ups. What you'll see being handed to me in just a moment is the rest of the screws that we needed for this bench top. I have 12 of the appropriate size clamps at the moment, so we're able to do three of these bench legs at a time, and then we'll move on to putting the rest of our screws to use. All right, here's the rest of our number 14 by two and a half inch Craig XL pocket hole screws. We're gonna use three of them. When I first started with the first box of these screws, I was scared that I was going to blow them too far through into the hole and totally just mess up the surface of the workbench on the other side. But if you grab the board that you're screwing into and listen, uh, you can actually feel the board get sucked down to the bench top and you can also hear the change in the tone of the impact driver uh, once it makes solid contact. So once you sense that, you just stop right there and you know you're just right. Don't go any further or you're gonna mess it up. One last quality check for square and we are looking good. That's gonna do it for part two of our workbench build. I'm not sure how many parts it's going to take, but we will do as many of them as we have to. So be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Tune in next week to see how far we can make it.